and it was used there between 1964 and 66. So figure rubber sole beetles. So while we were mixing Oceania, we actually mixed everything to the, to the Abbey Road machine too. And those mixes sound different. They don't sound unbelievably different, but they sound different. So we went to the record company and said, we'll do the Abbey Road mixes, and then um, a second disc, which would be the unreleased Oceani material, okay. which is everything from songs that no one's ever heard, which we haven't played live, which I'd be, which number in the five to seven range, okay. plus earlier cool alternate versions of Oceani songs. So basically enough to fill a B disc, and then enough to fill an A disc, and not have fans that bought Oceani feel like they're, but also take advantage of the marketing opportunity. Yeah. And they came back and said, no one's interested, no thanks. Um, we'll take 5,000 vinyl copies of the, of the Abbey Road mixes. And I said no. Is, is that, like, at one point there was like the Smashing Pumpkins record club. What about doing it through that or um, just releasing it? I thought about that too. I think, unfortunately, A, I haven't found anyone to run it right. Um, B, uh, Crestfall and Monty, which, yeah. is, uh, which is a fan site. Um, I had them conduct a poll at one point to see what fans would pay for previously unreleased music that the band owns. And I think 2,000 people took, a, took, took part okay. of the survey, and their price points were exactly the same as the stores. So basically the fans came back and said, oh yeah, we want unreleased material, but we won't pay any more than we would pay at iTunes or Okay. So you're talking about the most tech-savvy crowd that doesn't want to pay a premium for unreleased materials, right? That's where the, my point is, is that's where the fan base has an avowed to understand that if they're not willing to pay a premium, if we put out something and we invest our own money in it, and they buy 500 copies and then disseminate it for free, that'll be the last thing that ever comes out. So why am I going to take a chance to burn the whole bridge? So my point is, is that the audience has not evolved to understanding their consumer power. I'm sitting on a cache of all this unreleased material, but until the audience actually evolves to understand that they have the power to get me to court that stuff out. If I try and go out there and say, well, look, you know, I gotta, I gotta pay this and I gotta pay this guy and the amount, blah blah, then it's like, oh, Billy wants money. Appreciation. Well, Billy doesn't need your money, so okay, so the stuff sits in the pile. It makes it worthwhile. Appreciate what you can can get. Don't try and get something for nothing. I think you see an evolving relationship between artist and listener. Absolutely. It's becoming less artist and fan. It's actually artist and listener, more sophisticated thing. But until it evolves out of the old record model, which is like, how do we? Let's think of the old record model. Let's put out the old shit one more time, <laughs> and then get them to buy a few extra B sides, three or four. Yeah. Which is why, at least with the pumpkins reissues, I've tried to make sure there's lots of unreleased material. So even if you have, I mean, you got the best mastering guy in the world, Bob Ludwig, remastering the original catalog, and it does sound different and modern to me. And then you have all this unreleased material. To me, that's a fair deal. But when you're talking about stuff that the band's sitting on, questionable quality, it takes a lot of time to go through, and there isn't some big upside waiting out there, some record company waiting with hungry arms for it. I mean, they didn't even want the Oceania thing I proposed. So, no. No, um, It doesn't go, there's actually a guy who does a mod of it that you can get up to 22 to the purpose. Or, I, can, I never get paid. 22 k It only goes to 17. So it shelves off anything above 17. But if you think Abbey Road, like uh, Tax Man or something, it doesn't have a lot of high end, but it's got this kind of beautiful, dark, kind of fuzzy quality. That's what it sounds like. So imagine Oceania kind of like, almost if it had been made in the 70s. That's kind of what it sounds like. It's cool. It's got a darker, funkier vibe. Like uh, Quasar, for example, the snare's a lot deeper. Um, the groove's a little heavier. So it's, it almost sounds like it was made in 74. For me, it's in a different emotional experience, and you hear a different tonal range. And I'm a bootleg guy, so I mean, I, I like <laughs> if I got this mix of the Beatles this, or this mix of the Black Sabbath that, so same thing I got like every set that ever came out. So I'm interested in that. So, but I, I certainly think it would have been more than 5,000 people would have been interested. 
but on that, so you like one of the other things, kind of with Oceania, you always have different versions of the songs live than you have on the album. But with Oceania, you've been playing it a lot like the album. Why not take that and try to showcase what you can do, what you have been doing? I mean, in terms of evolving material. Yeah. Uh, I think it's too early for that. Okay. We're still, in essence, in the album cycle. Okay. And I think if you go listen to Bootlegs and Melancholy album, I mean, <laughs> outside of where it jams a little bit, I mean, you know, the same. Okay. I think that's the time. All right, let me uh, right here. Yep. 